Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our special webinar today entitled Building a Global Investment Portfolio in collaboration with our FundSmart partner, Sun Life Asset Management. I am Vanessa Galvez, Product Development Head at First MetroSec, and I will be your host for this afternoon. We hope you guys stick around until the end of our webinar for our speakers' discussions and a jam-packed Q&A where you can surely gain a lot of learnings, particularly how easy it is to invest in global funds to enhance your investment portfolio and even using your Philippine pesos. So now without further ado, let's get on with the reason why we are all here today on a Friday afternoon. And that is to get insights on where the global markets are headed and how we can build our very own global investment portfolio. So our main speaker is the head of global funds for Sun Life Investment Management and Trust Corporation. He is responsible for the formulation of investment strategies and portfolio construction of all Sun Life Philippines offshore products. During his 14 year time in the investment industry, he has held various roles in portfolio management, equity research, and trading. And just so you know how accomplished this guy is, his funds have consistently won in the Philippine Investment Association or PIFA awards in the global balanced and global equity categories. He is a graduate of Central Queensland University in Australia with a degree in business administration specializing in management and finance. He then went on to earn his MBA at the Asian Institute of Management. So guys, please give a virtual welcome to my good friend, Mr. Miko Vergara. Good afternoon, Miko. Hi, Van. Good afternoon, everyone. Hi, good afternoon. We're excited to hear what you have prepared for our audience. So the floor is yours. Okay, great. So maybe I'll just share my screen so no, uh, we can go through some of the slides I prepared. Okay. So I guess for the afternoon, before we really jump into it, no, maybe we can go through the agenda first. So we have some maybe five strong points why investors should think about um, allocating some assets offshore. Um, basically, you have behavior and bias. You have liquidity reasons. Uh, you have correlation. Uh, you have exposure. No different exposure types, um, and later we'll go into policy. So what is happening in the offshore markets? Uh, these things are also affecting Philippine assets. Eh? You know, so it's it's good to discuss what is moving markets now also. And if there's time later, uh, I know we have Q&A. Maybe we can delve into the process. No? So today we're highlighting one of our products specifically, but you know, later in the Q&A, we, we can tackle all of the other products, you know, uh, as needed, no, or as as asked by the by the audience. Okay, so let's get into it, no. So why invest offshore? So basically, people have to think about what are our options locally, no. Um, a lot of the time, it depends on who you speak to. It depends on what products are you know shown to you by your private bankers, by your branch managers. Um, you know, big um, investment companies take efforts to think about what their clients needs, but you know. It's not that the firms can do everything, right? Some firms are better at some things than others, right? Some are good at equities. Some are good at bonds. You know, it, it's very difficult to find a manager or a company who says we're good at everything. So, you know, for, for the purpose of this meeting, we're going to talk about one of the, you know, core competencies of our firm, of Slim TC. So we've been working with global assets since 2009. Um, we've been using fund of funds. So what's a fund of funds, right? Imagine buying... A conglomerate stock here locally, right? So what is in a conglomerate stock? Say you buy Ayala Corp. Ayala Corp has, um, you know, BPI, has Globe, has Ayala Land. So many, many, you know, um, sectors within one name. So fund of funds are, this, are similar, no? So we're buying a fund which holds hundreds of underlying equity names as well, you know? So that's one way to think about it. You're buying something which has more than one thing within it, no? So again, why, what should clients think about when investing offshore? Um, again, it's the state of you know, domestic options. 
can I get to the minimum required to bank with, say, Citibank or you know First Metro or BD or BPI? You know, some companies have limits, eh, like minimum investment amount, right? Another thing is um, AML regulations. Sometimes, if you invest offshore, uh, you would need to do face to face with your foreign bankers, right? So if you're talking about you know your your, your offshore banks, but means sometimes you have to do KYC, uh, sit a meeting once a year with your account officer. So that's another reason why people are looking at offshore products, but via local offshore, by via local companies. No, what's another thing? Um, the firm, again, is the firm good at it? Does the firm have the ties to manage offshore money? Does it have relationships with all of the you know with a lot of global fund providers? So that, that's another thing, right? Not all firms are structured to act this way, you know, or to manage this way. Uh, one more thing: regulatory environment. If you think about investing in U.S. Uh, assets, sometimes there's tax liabilities, right? Or oftentimes there's tax liabilities. If you invest in, say, USITS products, so these are investment vehicles which are listed in, in the Eurozone. No? They could be in Ireland, they could be in Luxembourg, they could be in London. So we have tax treaties with, this, with these markets. So some of the investments there, they're not taxable. Eh? So that's one more difference, right? If you're making money, but if you have to, if you have a tax obligation on your earnings, but that also eats into your net return. So again, that's another thing investors have to think about. Where are we investing? Do we have tax relationships with those countries? So in this uh, in this slide, no, I have a table on the right side. You see the numbers. So you have UK at the left. You have Japan on the on the right, right. So the bigger the percent, that's how much the investors of that country are more weighted in their home market. So like if you look at Japan, 67% of their in, of uh, no, the bulk of their of their investments are really in the Japanese, you know, in the Japanese market. They're not looking offshore. You know, th that could be for many reasons though. Some of them we've touched on a while ago. At the opposite side, if you look at the UK, um, they're at 26%. So IE they have more uh, exposure offshore. Again, maybe because of the reasons why, you know, maybe there's more access Maybe tax uh, obligations or tax treaties are more in place for them, but again, it's it depends case to case, no per country and per investor. What's another reason why we should look abroad, right? So, if you think of the number of countries you've traveled to, more often than not, these these guys also have their own stock index, you know, stock exchange, no, similar to the PSEI, but more often than not, their markets are much bigger than ours. So, what? How do you measure a stock market, right? Is it number of issuances? Is it average size of company? What we call market capitalization. So, you know, I, I don't know if you hear about it often, but market capitalization is a way of, of ascertaining if a company is big, you know, if it's liquid. That is just its share price times the number of shares it ha it's listed. No? So on the left table here, so these are the stock exchanges where you know, some of them were monitoring. So you have about 20 here, you know. The value of the, you know, their stock world, their stock universe is, are well over $104 trillion. It's quite big, right? So over 20 or so exchanges. And who's the biggest? You know, you have more of the North American, maybe US markets uh, there at, at the top, followed by China, you know, SHCOM, and then Japan, diba. Right? So you know the countries, and more often than not, these guys have stock exchanges, right? similar to the Philippines. So the other table on the right side, right? Um, it's It's not looking at the stock level, it's looking at GDP. But sometimes uh, one way, you know, I'm sure all of you are familiar with Warren Buffett, right? So one of his favorite um, ways of analyzing if markets are expensive is comparing the market cap or the value of the stock exchange against a country's GDP. So if you think about it, if the U.S. has the world's biggest GDP, should its stock exchange be one of the biggest as well? So it, it's sort of ha hand in hand, right? So China is its next biggest GDP, uh, next biggest country with uh, with the biggest GDP. So its stock market is maybe third or fourth right now, no, in terms of size. But the, you know, so more or less, that's one way to think about it. If you have a big economy, more often than not, you know, your stock exchange will follow. So again, there's many, many places we can invest in, you know, outside of the Philippines. What's point three for us? So correlations, no. So it's it, you, we don't hear about it often in the news, right? But it's something important to us investors because we have to think if we buy a country. Say, if we invest stocks in Japan, 
will it move if stocks in the US move up? So on this table, I'm showing you um, one to about six markets, no? Or five markets. It's showing you how they move with the US, no? In relation to the US. So if you have a correlation of one at the right side, but that means you move lock in step with the US. If US moves up 1%, you move up 1%. But look at Japan, right? It's on the left-hand side of this table. So offhand, it's telling you Japan isn't very correlated or it doesn't move necessarily if the US moves, right? So that's one thing to think about, right? If you buy countries, do they move together? Or you know, possibly, do they move in the opposite direction, right? We see that more often in, in terms of different asset classes. But offhand, you're seeing... UK and France on this table would move more with the US in the same direction as opposed to Japan and Taiwan could maybe be indifferent no, to whether the US moves up or down. They move on their own met their own um, valuations or their own drivers. So again, growth and earnings, right? That's the primary reason why we invest in stocks. Stocks are inherently more risky than bonds, right? But how what how do you determine the value of a stock? Are they making money? They should. You know, are they more profitable than other companies in their industry. What about if you extend that sample? No. What about a manufacturing company in the Philippines versus a manufacturing company in Vietnam or, or Taiwan, right? That's one way to compare, right? So ideally, the company is doing better. Um, investors recognize that and the share price of that company moves up. So again, one way to think about investing offshore is you have a bigger set of assets, right? So there's we're all familiar with uh, land. We're all familiar with BPI. You know, there are Thai banks, there are Thai property developing companies who may or may not have better valuations or better prospects. Um, so that's one way to think about it. We need to look offshore because we want alternatives, Deba. Right? We don't want to be stuck with the 30 names on the local index and the 250-something um, listed names right? on, on the Philippine exchange. So on this table, I'm, I'm showing you historical GDP growth and at the bottom part, projected. So backward, you know, things that have happened in the past, they don't necessarily happen again, right? But sometimes it's important to look at, you know, what's happened, you know, it, it previously to, to have a gauge of how things will be moving forward. So on this table, look at it. North America is on the left side. It's the light blue circle. Historically, North America has grown GDP at about 1.6%. But in terms of... Um, World Bank data or forecasts over the next, you know, four years, their GDP looks to be about 2.8. So isn't that above where they were previously? You now this is a forecast, right? This may change, but of fact, it gives you a barometer, a sense of who is doing better than they have in the past and who may be more challenged, right? That's one way to think about it. So again, if we invest offshore, we're not just betting on one country, right? What do you get when you invest in one country? You're hoping that companies in that country do well. You're hoping that policy by the central bank of that country is you know, accommodative or progressive. You're hoping that there's no regulatory risk in that country. So again, if we put all our eggs into one country, we're hoping for three things to happen, right? you know, three, thing, three things to go our way. But if we invest in multiple countries in the same way we maybe put our, you know, we invest in different parts of, you know, if we're buying property, Maybe we have property in the north. Maybe uh, we have property in Manila. We have property in the south, right? So we're not buying everything in one town or one street. We're spreading it out for different reasons. You know, better weather, um, cheaper entry points. So again, similar things with looking at countries. But some countries are more expensive. But sometimes, you know, you have to pay up to live there, right? For example, Japan, per square, you know, per square meter or per square unit of property there is very expensive compared to, to say somewhere in you know a province. Uh, in a developing market. So something to think about. Um, so we've talked about growth, right? But what is growth if there's no earnings, diba? Right? So you can have fantastic sales, but what if your margins, you don't have any um, margins or profit on what you're doing? That's not good also. So again, after the growth, you'd like, to be, you'd like there to be positive earnings at the end, right? For the shareholders. Because this is what backs up the you know the share price this is what backs up the loans of these companies so again if you look at this uh, table sorry it's a bit busy but let's start at the top so at the first row or, or rather second row you have msa acqui what is msa acqui so this is the short name for the global equity index so in 2021 in the second column it 
to, um, we're showing you how much they grew earnings, how much the global equity market grew earnings, right? So it's a, it was a very chunky 84%. But, you know, is that good? Is that bad? It's, it's really fantastic, I think. Eh? It's, uh, it's, but, but because yeah, we're coming from a low number, if you recall in 2020, when COVID-19 happened, right? Businesses shut, um, kids stopped going to school. So you expect that earnings fell significantly, right? So 2021 was sort of a banner recovery year uh, in that earnings really came up. But again, because of the low base in, 2019, in 2020. What about 2022? Will things stay this elevated? You know, Do things last forever is something you can think about. Tendency is you go back to your normal average, your normal you know, level of growth, eh? whether growth or earnings. So for 2022, this next year, um, for global equities, peop, uh, analysts think that earnings will grow by about 7%. You know, it's a far cry from 84% growth, right, in 2021. But again, it's more realistic. It's more closer to the, nor- to the normal um, situation or average, right? So what about other countries? You know, I don't want to think about just one country. So the U.S. is estimated to grow earnings by 9%. What about Japan? It's estimated to grow earnings by about 8%. So again, there's differences per line. And then where are the double digit guys? So you have China at about 14%. You have India at 17. Philippines at about 26%. So you see the difference. The bigger developed markets in the West, they're they're happy if they get high single, you know, single digit earnings. But for us, uh, developing markets, you know, we're on the move up palang eh. So we are expected somehow to deliver better earnings and better growth. So that's one burden placed on us right? as being um, an emerging market. But then again, it's interesting because the, the countries on this table, they're not putting out the same earnings number. Right? So there's beauty in the, in, in the differences among the countries. Eh? You can choose. So one more thing. Right? We've thought about growth. We've thought about earnings. What about valuations? So people think about Valuations in different ways, right? If you're talking about a bank, I guess the popular metric would be price to book because banks have a lot of cash, right? They're not really um, physical asset heavy, so it's price to book. If you look at a consumer company, more oftentimes it's um, PE, so price to earnings. So it really depends on the valuation metric you like. And sometimes, you know, I'm not saying which is the best one. I'm just saying if you look at this table, some countries are priced differently because of different factors or different characteristics, right? So in this table, you have North America at the upper right side of this um, sort of chart, right? It means that they're very expensive compared to EM, compared to EMEA, compared to the Pacific in terms of price to book. But why is that, right? There's always a reason why something is priced cheaply or expensive. So in this sense, at least on this metric, no, in terms of return on equity, uh, North America has a higher level no, compared to the other three markets. So it's not simple enough to say, one market is expensive, I don't like it. Diba? It could be this market is expensive because it gives something over what the rest of the, or what the other markets can give you. Diba? Like if you're buying property in a popular village, right? Or subdivision here in the, met- in the metro, more often than not, on a per, on a per square meter basis, they're more expensive. Then something again in a developing part of the Philippines. So again, think about why is something expensive, and think about will it retain that characteristic moving forward to justify being expensive, right? So what is you know what is what is the product we're trying to focus on today, right? Um, I've been asked by First Metro and Slamsi to talk about the Wave. So Wave is a passive product. It doesn't try to differ too much from the benchmark. So again, what, what is its benchmark? Its benchmark is the Global Equity Index, what I call the MSCI ACQUI. So ACQUI stands for All Country World Index. So it has all or most of the global sort of global equity markets you know, within it. So on this table, up the, on the upper left-hand side, I'm showing you the number of stocks within the ETF or within the product no, that the WAVE, the World Equity Index is buying. Um, it holds about 2,400 stocks. If you think about what it's copying, the index, it has well over 3,000. So again, it's not, it doesn't hold the same number of stocks, but it holds something close to that number and tries to approximate it. So on the right side, I'm showing you sectors. So it's hard to get your head around what are 2,400 stocks, right? 
But if we, if we cut it up in terms of sectors, maybe it's more easy to digest. So what is the biggest sector in the MSI Aqui? It's as of you know this printing, this is late September, I believe, um, information technology. So what's that? So technology companies, um, payment companies, um, software companies, they are 22% of this index. So if you compare that, what's the biggest uh, sector locally, right? Um, either it's the conglomerates or a combination of property and um, financials. No? So again, it's quite different from what is offered on the local exchange because the, the companies also listed offshore are also different. What about the countries? So at the bottom, so US is the biggest part of it. Again, we talked about GDP, right? So US has the biggest GDP um, level. So it's stock universe also, you know, close to the top or, or actually is the top. Eh? What's after the US? So you have Japan as the next single biggest country. Then you have China. So yeah, it's quite similar to the GDP numbers we showed a while ago. Okay, so, you know, we've talked about Acqui. Um, maybe we'll, let's, I'll pause there. We'll endeavor to what are drive, what, what we think will drive equity or asset markets um, in the next year. Okay. So Federal Reserve policy, right? So the BSP, our central bank, also has policy. Right? So all countries have central banks who try to regulate and moderate their own um, markets. So the liquidity in each market. So what was good for emerging markets like the Philippines back in 2013 or pre-2013? People were investing from moving money from, say, Europe, US to us because, like, because of the chunky or you know, elevated growth, right? But what happened in 2013? That was the first time the whole taper tantrum or taper episode became popular as a, as a catchphrase. No? So what does taper mean? It means that the, the Federal Reserve, the U.S. Central Bank, is going to try to stop or rather look to stop buying bonds. Um, so again, why would they do that? They do this um, when economies are having a hard time. So they try to bring down interest rates. So, for example, wh why is that good? Why are low rates good, no? per se, for employers, for employees? If rates are low, companies can borrow. Companies can use the money they borrowed to expand their businesses. What about you know households like mine? If rates are low, I could borrow, um, you know, a more take a take a housing loan, and have lower amortizations, right? So in a sense, moderate or um, low rates allow for more consumption. More people can borrow. More people can spend what it, what is being borrowed, right? So if that is being taken away in a tapering scenario, like rates will be moving up. What's the risk? The people who invested um, outside uh, may bring their money back with them to, to their home market. So that's Europe or the US. So that thing is happening again, prospectively, no? in 2022 and 2023. So what's the risk? Back in 2013, was well, the first time it happened, again, emerging market assets were sold because the buyers, the foreign buyers had to let go. Right? You have to sell something to get your proceeds and move back to your home market where you think it's a safe haven. So prospectively, we think this will happen again. About if rates move up in the states, um, potentially flows which came into Asia emerging markets will move back with them. So how will that pan out? History doesn't happen. You know, history won't happen in the same degree. But as an example, in 2013, um, EM currencies were weaker because of this outflow. Um, EM equities were also weaker because of these outflows. Now. So it's a risk we're seeing again coming into 2022. But what else is different uh, compared to then? Again, so we talked about growth being better, right? So if you're going to invest with a small bank, a rural bank, for example, you would probably go with them because they're offering you better TD rates or better interest rates. But you know, why would a big bank, you know, the popular ones like Metro Bank, BDO, BPI, why they don't have to meet the, the rate of the low of the rural bank because they have size, right? So let's think about that. In 2013, if you bought emerging market assets, you would benefit from more GDP growth. You would benefit from more earnings growth. So on the yellow shaded part here at the side, can you see the differential? So in terms of earnings, there was a 12.6% difference or pickup by buying emerging market assets. But what about this, you know, this time around? Actually, earnings in uh, emerging markets look to be weaker compared to DEM this time around. So if before 
you're you're compensated by buying riskier assets in emerging markets. This time around, that the, that case isn't there anymore. So that's one risk I see for the market. So I guess to wrap up, so from the bigger catalyst, which is the tapering and the difference in earnings expectations this time around, what else you know can we look forward to in 2022? Earnings are still positive, which is a good thing. So they're not at the double digit we saw in 2021, but they're at a strong or solid single digit clip. I think that will support appetite for risk assets like equity still. The Federal Reserve promises or is communicating that they will try to remain accommodative, meaning they want to support the economy and won't try to stop you know, the liquidity right away. Last point, COVID is still a, it's a consideration. You know, Even with everyone um, getting better uh, vaccine results right, globally, right? People still have to wear, you know, uh, masks. People still don't go to work in the same percent. Like, not all of us at Slim TC are going to work. So there are going to be some adjustments which have to happen. People have to get used to this current environment. Right? There's no return to full normal like before. And then on portfolio allocations, we're neutral on asset allocations for our balance mandates. Um, we On the equity side, we like developed markets still. Um, safe haven, lower volatility historically. And there's the benefit of being closer to herd immunity no? because of the vaccine rollout. On the fixed income side, we're underweight duration uh, because of the prospect of rising rates, right? If rates move up, that's bad for bond prices. So we have to be underweight duration on that side. So I'll pause here. I'll turn it back to Van. No? Uh, hope we have a lot of interaction during the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Miko, for that informative presentation. So as investors, we know that we shouldn't put our eggs in the same basket. You just reminded us that diversification is not just based on asset class, like bonds and stocks, but also based on geographical location. And for regular folks like us, we do, who do not have the expertise or the time to research on international markets, passively investing in global funds uh, seems to be the easiest and safest way to do it. So thanks, Miko. You can rest for now. We'll see you again in a while. So now let me introduce to you the next speaker. We have here someone who will impart to us how the Sun Life funds fit into various investment portfolios, no matter what investment profile you may have. So she's currently the broker channel specialist of Slam C handling the distribution of Sun Life funds through various broker partners like First MetroSec. So to guide us with various funds available on FundSmart, especially the newest edition, the World Equity Index Fund or WAVE, please welcome Ms. Lurcy Cuenca. Go ahead, Lurcy. Hello, Van, and um, good afternoon to all the attendees. No, thank you for spending your Friday afternoon with us. I have here a uh, video no, prepared to intro my presentation. Kara, can you please play the video? Ready to step up your investing journey? Invest in global companies using your Philippine pesos. Make it happen with the Sun Life Prosperity World Equity Index Feeder Fund. The latest offering from Sun Life Asset Management. This new product is a feeder fund that invests in a target fund. The target fund tracks the performance of the MSCI All Country World Index, which represents more than 2,000 leading companies across developed and emerging markets. Sun Life Prosperity World Equity Index Feeder Fund will enable you to invest in a fund that matches your long-term horizon. Capitalize on stocks in developed and emerging markets. Diversify your investment portfolio. Enjoy potentially high returns. And get closer to your long-term financial goals. All with the help of professional fund managers and the support of the largest non-bank asset management company in the country. Set your eyes on the world with the Sun Life Prosperity World Equity Index Feeder Fund, your ticket to global markets. Connect with us now to learn more about it. Only from Sun Life Asset Management.
So I hope no, the video got you more excited about uh, weight. So let me just share my slide. Okay, so um, this fund no, that we are uh, focusing this afternoon, the Sun Life Prosperity World Equity Index Feeder Fund, or uh, we call it WAVE no, for short, this has been launched by uh, Slam C since last year, no, last July 2020. And in just over a year, this uh, fund no, has grown its AUM to uh, 37 billion already uh, as of end October. And uh, this just proves that the fund has uh, garnered the interest of uh, our clients. And for um, for Fund Smart, this fund has been in the platform for uh, almost three months, and it is also well received by uh, Fund Smart investors. So um, first, Metrosec also is the first online broker to distribute with. So I know you are wondering why the very long name for the Sun Life Prosperity World Equity Index Feeder Fund, no? But um, actually, the name is like that because we want it to be very descriptive. So for you to better appreciate WAVE, uh, I'm breaking down the name of the fund for you into two. First is a World Equity Index, no? So WAVE is a unitized equity fund that aims to track the performance of the Morgan Stanley Capital International All Country World Index, so or MSCI actually, and this was um, also mentioned by Nico a while ago. So later on, I'll further explain what MSCI actually is. Second is a feeder fund. WAVE is a feeder fund that invests at least 90% um, of its assets no, in a target fund. And the target fund, no, the underlying assets of the target fund is U.S. denominated, U.S. dollar denominated. What's unique about WAVE is that uh, the fund is Philippine peso denominated, but it allows you access to global market. So this means that for peso earners out there, you are now able no, to invest and diversify globally with the convenience provided by WAVE. So now um, I'll be discussing about uh, MSCI ACWI. So um, MSCI ACWI is an index designed to provide a broad measure of the global equity markets from developed and emerging markets. So um, MSCI ACWI covers over 2,000 securities no, upon checking no, uh, this morning, it has already 2,700 securities, and it consists of uh, 50 countries from developed and emerging markets. Now, as you can see here on the map, you can see that United States is approximately more than 50% of the index, no, followed by Japan and China. And if you're wondering why, that is because uh, United States no, has the biggest uh, stock market mentioned by Miko also a while ago. No, it has the uh, biggest companies, most of those companies you already know, no? the famous guys no? from the tech sectors, the FANG stocks. So um, they're all in the U.S., no? making it, uh, ha having it the heaviest weight no? in the index. So in short, if MSCI ACWI is the index for uh, which provides a broad measure for the global equity markets, here in the Philippines, no, we have the PSEI, naman, di ba? which consists of 30 companies. No? That is the barometer for the local Philippine equities market. So MSEI, again, is consists of uh, over 2,000 securities, more than 50 countries, from more than 50 countries, providing a barometer for the global equity market performance. Now, allow me to... Um, Talk about the target fund, no? The target fund having that long name too, no? But we call it just Spider. So this fund was launched in 2011, and this has already over 1.5 uh, US billion US dollar in assets under management. So this is managed by State Street Global Advisors, and they are one of the leading global asset management companies in the world. And with over 2,000 securities. Spider tracks the equity performance of developed and emerging markets. So again, um, 90 per, at least 90% of WAVE is invested in this target fund. Now let's discuss more about our fund in focus this afternoon. 
WAVE's uh, objective is long-term capital appreciation by investing in a target fund that tracks the performance of the MSCI equity. So the base currency of this fund is in Philippine Peso, and it is unhedged, no? meaning the fund is um, exposed to currency risk. So you can start investing in WAVE for as low as 50,000 pesos, and um, addition, minimum additional investment is at 10,000 pesos. So this fund is suitable for those investors with an aggressive risk profile and long-term investment horizon. So I'm showing here the fund fact sheet of WAVE. And um, if you have an account with First Metro Securities, you, know, you can uh, always download you know, the latest fund fact sheet that we have. So this document will show you an update on the fund, you know, specifically on the top holdings, the sector allocations, and the geographical uh, allocation of the fund. Speaking of that, no, uh, for global diversification, I would just like to highlight uh, this advantage that WAVE can bring into your portfolio. So if here uh, locally in the Philippines, diba, we have the PSEI that is exposed to, of course, one country only in diba, the Philippines. For WAVE, it will diversify your investment to 50 countries no, from developed and emerging markets. And here on the left pie chart, you can just see uh, the top eight no, led by uh, United States. And if, it, if PSEI has uh, 30 companies no, in the index, for WAVE, it has, again, over 2,000 securities. So here on the uh, right uh, pie chart, you can just see the top 10 no, stocks with the heaviest weight in uh in wave no so here you can see the famous guys no apple microsoft amazon facebook alphabet that's google tesla of elon musk taiwan semiconductor and nvidia so uh if there are gamers here no i know you are very much familiar with uh nvidia one of the leading companies in the gaming pc industry so this sh this just shows that your investment in wave is uh, really fully diversified, no? uh, 50 countries and over 2,000 securities. So WAVE does not only diversify your investments no? in different countries, but it will also provide um, exposure to sectors that are unavailable here locally. So Mika also showed uh, a table no? a while ago showing the sectors available in the MSEI ACWI. So here in PSEI, we have um, sectors like financials, consumer discretionary, industrials, uh, communication services, and the others. But for um, MSCI ACME, which the WAVE tracks, no, it has sectors like IT and uh, healthcare no, available. So for instance, if you take a look at the table for PICO, no, that's uh, PSEI, we don't have enough um, stocks no, here in the PSEI that would constitute a sector for IT. Similar also with healthcare, no, but for IT, MSCI has, has around 20% exposure to that sector. And for healthcare, we have around 13% um, in MSCI ACWI. And this, we know that these two sectors are the th uh, thriving no, and the resilient sectors during the pandemic. So this just goes to show that WAVE no, can uh, allow you investors to hold sector leaders from IT, no, Microsoft, Facebook, and Google, and uh, healthcare sectors like Pfizer, Moderna, or AstraZeneca. So how did the fund perform so far? So on a one-year basis, the fund has returned 38%, and year-to-date, it has returned 23.16%. And just to summarize the advantages of um, investing in the World Equity Index Feeder Fund, first, of course, it will allow you to invest in over 2,000 securities worldwide. No? So if you'd like to have exposure in those names that I mentioned a while ago, no? Apple, Microsoft, Facebook, Google. So you can invest in these uh, companies through WAVE. Second, it allows access to the global stock market using your Philippine peso. No? Uh, this is only one of those few products in the Philippines that allows this. No? Uh, WAVE provides that convenience. No? Your Philippine peso will be invested in a US dollar denominated target fund. And lastly, WAVE will allow you to diversify globally for long-term growth. So 
for those investors here who are purely whose portfolios are purely invested in uh, local equities now we recommend that you diversify uh, globally in funds like WIF because it will help you reduce a country concentration risk in your portfolio and enhance your asset allocation and enhance your um, portfolios overall volatility you now so for for those who would like to um, get closer to their long-term financial goals, we recommend that you uh, invest in the World Equity Index Feeder Fund or WEIGHT. And this fund is your ticket to global markets. And that's for me. Thank you very much again. All right. So that's great information, Lurs. I have always been vocal that I'm an avid Sun Life investor from the Money Market Fund to the World Voyager Dollar Fund and most recently, uh, the World Equity Index Feeder Fund. And throughout the years, I haven't been disappointed with the fund's performance. I'm sure our viewers are also a click away from logging on to FundSmart and subscribing to Sun Life Prosperity Funds. Another good news is that the Sun, Li that Sun Life has taken out the holding period for most of the funds. So no more waiting for six months before you can redeem without early redemption fees. All right, so thanks again, Lurcy. We'll see you again a bit later for the Q&A. Uh, may I request uh, Miko to join us on video? Lurcy is already here. Ayan. So thank you. So again, send in your questions by typing in, typing them in the webinar chat box or click the question mark icon. So time is of the essence. Let's start with the first question. Uh, Miko, how are the various country risks managed for global funds? And how often are these assets rebalanced? Okay, so for you know, we have to think about it in two sides. On, on, in terms of two sides, right? We have products which are passive, like Wave. We have products which are active, like say Glo uh, World Voyager. So on the active mandates, we we can only go above a country weight no? uh, by certain notches. So it's not like I like US only. I dislike Europe. I'll remove everything from Europe. That that, that won't work. Eh? We can only go you know underweight by a certain amount. In the same way, we can only go overweight a certain amount. So this is what we call managing the tracking error, because we don't, you know, even if we have good ideas, we still want to reflect that we follow a benchmark. But again, we're not held to it. So for the for the topic today, you know, for Wave, it it doesn't really have to manage risk because it's copying. It has to replicate the benchmark purely. So it whatever sector tilts that the uh, the benchmark has, like uh, MSCI Aqui, Wave has to copy it by virtue of the ETF. No? So different intent uh, and different product types to take note of. All right, all right. So since you're uh, answering questions already, uh, an, an additional question. The U.S. has been rallying for the past months. Is it still a good time to invest in global funds like the Nasdaq is currently at 15,900? Is it still advisable to invest in U.S. equities? Yeah, we're still bullish on, on the U.S. No, it's still a key position. Um, I guess compared to 2020, um, coming into 2021, no, our overweight is lo a lot smaller on the active mandates. But that being said, we can't you know, totally undo U.S. We can't remove it. It's it's part of the index, and we have to respect that. So again, we are taking calculated um, positions in different sectors. So this is again, this is on the active mandates. U.S. should grow earnings by about nine to ten percent next year. So again, it's something which will support, um, should support uh, appetite for risk assets. Yes, and I guess that's where the professional management comes in. For you to choose how to, uh, which stocks to get and uh, by how much. All right. So next question is for Lurcy. Um, Sun Life Wave is a peso denominated fund, but the target fund is dollar denominated. Do I gain more when I invest in peso? Uh, when I invest when the peso is stronger versus the dollar? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, Van. So uh, I guess the the that client no uh, heard about Wave being unhedged no, as I mentioned a while ago. So um, Wave is unhedged, meaning the investors are exposed to foreign currency risk. So investors will of the fund will be exposed to fluctuations in the uh, U.S. dollar and the peso exchange rate. Now, but if in a scenario where um, 
peso is depreciating versus dollar, it would be beneficial for the client because apart from the gains from the fund, the client may also gain no, from foreign exchange. So it's like two-pronged returns, no gains from the fund and uh, gains from foreign exchange. And for instance, no um, Sun Life's forecast for year-end 2021 for US dollar uh, peso exchange rate is in a range of of uh, 50 to 51 and for next year year and 2022 the forecast is uh between uh, uh the range of 51 to 53 so that may translate to you know a potential upside also due to foreign exchange maybe related to that um so since it's a hedge there's a question here how does the fund protect itself from forex fluctuation nico can you um answer that yeah, so we're we're unhedged like uh, like Lercy pointed out. Now. So we have to take mm -hmm. it um, hand in hand. But but you know, since we're we're buying in, for example, for we're buying in U.S. equities, you know, taking that that FX risk is part of that that um, positioning. So again, we if we do hedge it, you know, it's something I don't uh, rule out as doing at a, at a later point. No, maybe a different version or different share class. Uh, it's something we can do. But of course, that also comes with a cost. So taking a hedge on the currency, it's like buying insurance. So even if uh, we didn't need the hedge, that will also eat into the investment returns, right? So the view is, if you're hedging something, you are hoping that the volatility is bigger than your cost. So it's something to consider. Uh, but in our, in our, for our purposes, no, um, MSCI Acqui is basically a dollar. Um, you know, it's it's primarily an offshore currency um, index. Eh? So it's part and parcel, again, of keeping WAVE unhedged. All right. How about the debt problems in China, Miko? Are these a cause of concern for global equities? I think it's, you know, it's, it's been weighing on the market now. So it started with uh, Evergrande. Now we see it sort of creeping to other co co companies within the property sector. But we have to think about why is, the, is, why is Beijing doing this? They're looking for stability. They're trying to impose market, you know, um, make impose stronger regulations so um, asset bubbles hopefully won't happen, and that you know um, companies and developers are more accountable for what they're doing. So I think the intent is good. I think the market just has to come to grips with how long will this, you know, it will this be prolonged? Uh, will this expand into other sectors? So it's a headwind on the on the country on the region no? but i think if you look what they're doing it why they're doing it there, there's good intentions behind it i see right next question is for lurcy um Lursi, for someone with a 30-year investment horizon is it better to just stick to philippine index funds since the philippines ex is expected to outperform the global index due to its emerging market status mm. all right so um I would say, no, personally, um, if my time horizon would be 30 years, I would be diversifying in both um, Philippine equities and uh, global equities. No? That's correct. There is value, really, in investing in local equities, especially during this time no, that the Philippines is just, you know, uh, starting to ramp up and analysts say that we are, you know, in for an economic recovery and outperformance next year. So, um that's correct, no? Value investing in the Philippines uh, for long-term goals is a must, no? But then we must remember that um, economic recovery is, uh, you know, not just uh, limited in the Philippines, no? And that we must diversify globally in funds like wait for our long-term goals because um, diversifying globally will inject uh, growth drivers to our portfolio and it will enhance no, our uh, overall, you know, portfolio asset allocation. So uh, for the, for that um, client who has a 30-year time horizon or no, maybe for a retirement fund, no, uh, I would recommend diversifying both in local and global yeah me too <laughs> um i, I want to ask you this uh, uh Lurcy. a lot of people have been going to foreign online brokers uh like mm. eToro that also mm. offer global funds so why mm -hmm. should we invest in sun life wave or the sun life global funds instead of going straight to these uh foreign funds 
Oh, okay, so yeah, uh, that's correct, Van. No? eToro has been gaining popularity uh, these days. And I have personally checked also eToro. And I have seen uh, global funds there, no? ETFs like uh, Vanguard. And these are all um, dollar-denominated uh, funds. So I guess if um, we're highlighting here an advantage of a wave, that would be wave being uh, peso-denominated. No? Because we know a lot of um, majority of investors in fund smart are peso earners no and with being peso denominated it will make um diversifying easily accessible to these investors so for um so if ever you would want to recalibrate your portfolio easily no you don't have to exchange your peso to dollars anymore anymore so wave allows you to invest using your peso yes and then there's tax tax benefits by right yeah, for mutual correct, funds. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's correct. All right. So, um, Nico, um, let me ask you this: What industries are you focused on? Maybe this this is one. This is for the more actively managed funds. Are healthcare and tech still a good choice post pandemic? Okay. So, in terms of sectors, we're looking at um, maybe it's a balance. No, it's not going to be totally the defensives anymore. It's not going to totally be growth. Eh? So that, that's one difference. In 2020, you had one type of company doing well, right? The growth-oriented ones. In 2021, the current year, no, it's more of the opposite the value. So I think uh, given that the reasons for for the different years are, you know, diminish, are, are being diminished, it will go back to a more normal market where it's not going to be one style. Eh? So for us, we're looking at uh, reflation place. So you have property, we're looking at REITs, we're looking at you know growth themes at the same time. So we're, I guess to, to summarize, it has to be more than one sector type. No, It can't be the, the blanket black or white type sectors anymore. Parang it has to be a combination of all types of sectors again, a more normal market. Yes, that's right. Um, maybe we can uh, get two more questions before we end. Um, this is a general question uh, either of you can answer. If we do a cost averaging, what is the recommended subscription timing? Is it monthly? Is it every two weeks, weekly? Okay, um, can I answer first? No? Um, well, that actually depends uh, on the on the investor, no, van, no, depending on the convenience of investing. So as for me, no, personally, I do it monthly, no? Um, investing in my funds no monthly doing cost averaging uh dedicating a part of my you know salary every month for my retirement fund or other long-term goals and that depends on the investor no sa convenience niya. as for me um monthly is more convenient for me all right me too actually i have a monthly <laughs> investment plan mm -hmm. um uh, for the last question maybe from the fund manager himself miko if you had just pesos would you recommend using those pesos now to invest globally or maybe switching your investments from Philippine equities to global equities? Okay, so thanks, Van. It's a, it's a very relevant question. Um, maybe what is different for the investor? They're used to holding Philippine assets, right? So all this offshore investment seems very different or exotic. But in reality, from a global perspective, Holding global US Europe is the normal. Holding Philippine assets is the off benchmark or is the is the bet. So maybe I would structure it in my if I was to be asked, no, I would structure it with offshore as the core and Philippines as my kicker. Just because that's how the proportion of the assets really are in the global market. All right. So even in diver diversification, pala, there's already the new normal. Okay. So I uh, and that's it for today's Q and A. Uh, I, I hope we had more time, but unfortunately, uh, we have to cut it short. Thank you, Miko and Lurcy, for sharing such incisive and helpful answers to everyone's questions and for sharing your time with us today. Uh, our biggest thanks as well to everyone uh, for your active participation. If we missed your question, there were so many. Please email it to us at events at firstmetrosec.com.ph 
and we'll try our best to reply to you there. And we'll also ask Clercy and Nico for those answers uh, that we cannot give directly. All right. Once again, we're encouraging you to take part in our Invest and Get Rewards promo, where we will be rewarding five monthly winners of 3,000 pesos worth of investment credits each. This promo is only until November 30, 2021, so don't miss this chance. And you can learn more about the Sun Life Prosperity Funds, including WAVE. Simply log on to your first MetroSec trading account and click on FundSmart or Funds found on the upper right-hand corner of the platform. So for now, this is available on new and pro. It's not yet on the mobile app, but maybe soon. So the prospectus, the fact sheets, historical returns, and everything you need are readily available on the platform. No additional fees to invest, no broker's fees, and absolutely no sales loads on all of the funds. If you have friends or family who missed this but are interested in investing globally, go ahead and share this video. We hope that through this webinar, you were able to gain insights that can help you in your global investing journey, a journey that we at First PetroSec want to share with you. So thank you for our live viewers for being part of this webinar on a Friday afternoon. We truly appreciate that you were able to share your time with me, Miko, Lursi, and the rest of the Slamsey and First MetroSec teams. To get the latest market news and updates, First MetroSec exclusive events like this one, and everything in between, please like our Facebook page, follow us on Instagram and Twitter, and subscribe to our YouTube channel with the handle at First MetroSec. So please do also like Slamsey's page on Facebook to get first dibs on fund and market updates. You, could, you can find them at facebook.com slash sunlifeph. All right, so that's it for today. This has been your host, Vanessa, wishing you well. Please stay safe and healthy. And as always, with First MetroSec, it's hashtag your future first. Happy weekend, everyone.